Um, and let me introduce you to Peter Gerhardt. Some of you have met Peter before when he was here a couple of years ago, a year and a half, to do a workshop for ACT, Autism Community Training, on um, supporting adolescents and adults, um, especially in job situations and uh, school to post school transition. And a, a couple of us were, were there and um, went, oh, we have to get him for BC ABBA. So we did, after much you know, gnashing of teeth. Um, at that point, he was the founder, he still is the founder, but was also the president of the Organization for Autism Research in Baltimore, which he ran for seven years. And since then, he's now living in New Jersey, um, which is the poor cousin of New York. Um, working in the upper school, upper what? Division? The upper school. Upper school of the McCartan School. Um, uh, Peter and I both share New York, New Jersey roots, so he's happy to be back there and I'm jealous. Um, and uh, Peter uh, has spent uh, you know, the, a larger part of his professional career um, trying to convince people that um, after kids turn six, they still really do have a life and we need to actually be thinking older than age six for these kids and um, really looking at adolescents and adults and some of the issues. Um, he's a wonderful speaker. He's got some wonderful research to share with us tonight. Um, he's hysterically funny, so um, hold on to your hats. Now I've set you up really big time. And um, I hope you'll help me welcome Peter Gerhardt. I hate when people say I'm funny. It's so much pressure now. Is this on? Is this? OK, cool. First of all, I want to thank Pat and everybody with BC Ava, uh for having me out here. Um, and I, I told her this when I saw her um, when I was last time in Vancouver. But I honestly would not be the professional that I am today or do the work that I'm doing today if it wasn't for the work that Pat has done. Um, a lot of her stuff really was instrumental in how I understood the world from a behavior analytic framework um, and a very person-centered framework, so I have to give credit where credit is due. So I am at the upper school um, at the McCartan School right now. Just so you know, the, this is for kids who have a classic autism diagnosis. Uh, I right now have 11 kids in my program. Uh, my goal for this program for these kids uh, is to transition these kids into independent living in adulthood, meaning a job, a value of friendships, community events, all this sort of stuff but with no paid supports. So I am looking at transitioning these kids, classic autism, pretty significant challenges, into a life with no paid supports. Now, I will tell you quite honestly at this point, I don't have a clue how I'm going to do that. I have a plan, but we all know what happens when you make plans. Okay? One of my favorite sayings is, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. So that's sort of where I am right now, but I think that's the goal we all need to have. What's happened is we've sort of lowered the bar successively year after year to like Pat alluded to, like you hit six and we sort of said you're maxed out. As opposed to looking that there's this whole world beyond that, that there's this whole life experience. Um, the other thing I just want to point out is um, in my private practice, I really do work across the spectrum, and I have for many, many years. Um, in my private practice, um, with individuals with classic autism, I work with adults who tend to have some pretty significant behavior challenges. Um, and with the adults with Asperger's syndrome who I work with, um, who I guess we're going to lose a diagnosis, and then I'll lose all my clients. So that's one way we can cure this whole part, is just to forget the diagnosis. Um, I work with adults who are in the criminal justice system, adults who are convicted of crimes. Um, so one of the things that I will point out is that it doesn't matter where you fall on the spectrum, whether it's autism or developmental disability spectrum. You know, life is tough. And unless we're preparing kids for life, okay, we're setting kids up for a life that we wouldn't accept. And that's where the problem lies. Okay, we sort of say, this is good enough for you, but I wouldn't do it. Okay? So we need to sort of set the bar, the bar higher for everybody if we're going to be successful. Uh, just a couple people that I'd also like to thank. Joanne Gowan, Sir Kathy Mayer, Nicole Wiedenbaum, Megan Attow, Gloria Satriali, Jim Sack, Suzanne Letzo, Mary Jane Weiss, Zosha Zacks, Tom Zane, Dana Sack, and James Sack, and a whole bunch of other people. But 
My overall theme for this evening, confidence, dignity, and quality. Okay? That's what your life should be, right? That, you know, you're competent, you're dignity, you have dignity in your life, and you have some quality items. Like, like, like quality concerns are addressed, which I think really is sort of summed up as home alone. Okay? Your students, think about your students. Think about your sons, your daughters. Think about your clients. Think about anybody that you work with, whatever label you want to give them. Okay? And if you weren't there, if nobody was there for a week, what would they do? What would they do? Would they get something to eat? Okay? Would they get dressed? Would they take a shower? Would they make a phone call? Would they get help? Would they take a bus to go somewhere? Would they call up friends? Did they know how to, like, what would they do? Okay? I asked this at a school once, a very good behaviorally based school for 28 kids. And I asked the staff that. And they said one kid in the school would call to get help. But they had kids who could do math. We could do a math worksheet. Okay? But nobody knew how to get help. And I really am tired at this point in my life of meeting adults who could do a math worksheet. Okay? <laughs> there are no jobs where you do a math worksheet. Okay? Nobody's profile on Match.com says, I can do a math worksheet. It is not a desirable outcome. But knowing what to do, how to get help, knowing how to use a bathroom, knowing how to go out to a restaurant, knowing how to navigate those, that's all kind of cool stuff. Okay? So we really need to start thinking. And again, with individuals who may be less compromised or obviously compromised by their disability, you know, kids with Asperger's syndrome who are, they can factor a binomial equation, but don't know how to go to a job interview, don't know how to drive a car, don't know how to interact with other people, how to have friends, how to do all this other sort of stuff. Okay, we're not addressing the core skills. Well, you know, I am a behavior analyst, and this is a behavior analysis conference, so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about behavior analysis and research. Um, Oftentimes, when I talk and say that I'm a behavior analyst and I work with adolescents and adults, uh, people look at me like I'm crazy. Um, I actually had a psychologist once in Pennsylvania tell me that there's absolutely no research to support the use of applied behavior analysis with individuals with autism beyond the age of 12. Right? I said, that's fascinating. <laughs> I said, I said, there is research. As a matter of fact, much of our early research is done with adults. Okay, but also I said, that's sort of like saying there's no research on the impact of gravity on zebras on the Serengeti Plain just because nobody bothered to do an actual study on that. But we can assume that because the zebras aren't floating above the plain, that gravity is an effect. Okay? Um, applied behavior analysis, they're the principles of learning. Like, it's, it's not a mystical... Um, philosophical belief system. It's how we learn. That's it. When I, when I see programs and they say, well, we're not an ABA program, what I tell them is, of course you are. You just suck at it. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, just because you, you choose not to use the principles of learning to instruct your kids, it just makes you a bad one. <laughs> That's all. Like, you can't say, well, we're not an oxygen program. We don't let our kids breathe oxygen. Like, you can't. Okay? We all know this. This is not, okay, this is just one of the many definitions of applied behavior analysis. Uh, oops. A little too fast there. Uh, a field of inquiry dedicated to investigating and modifying behavior in a systematic way. Yes, it's a database. Okay? But as kids get older, I really <coughs> emphasize, take the right data. Like, really think about the data you're collecting and why you want this data and what are you going to do with it. Okay, I, I cannot tell you how many data sheets I've reviewed that just are useless and tell me nothing about this individual in particular. But I know how many times he tapped his head. I'm like, good, because that really tells me where to go with this person. Okay? Analytical. It does force me to think, and it forces me to think from the point of view of the guys I work with. Not from my point of view, from their point of view. Like, like we have this, this in autism, there's this, 
um, diagnostic criteria insistence on non purposeful rituals and routines, right? Don't be criteria because they're incredibly purposeful for the person. They know exactly why they're doing it. Okay, I just don't know why. Okay, so I got to figure out what works for you. Okay, and actually, the data I'll show you towards the end of this one young man, you know, looking at some of his communicative intent. Yes, it was to access tangibles, but it really was particular food items he wanted. So we had to really look at, like, what do you want, and how do we give you the skills to get that under what conditions? Like, it wasn't just, I need a break, pay attention to me, I need help. It's like, I want that lasagna. Okay? So we had to really go from his point of view. It's able to be replicated. It's science, but it ain't rocket science. Okay? If I can do it, anybody can do it. It's accountable. allows me to go back. I, some of the kids I work with now are as young as 12. That's a little young for me, okay? I would like to get that on tape. That's a little young for me. <laughs> but when I thought about it again, it like, that allows me to make a lot of mistakes. And I say that very proudly, but I have to be able to fix my mistakes quickly. One of the problems in our field is that we make mistakes and they keep going. You know, we keep charging through, thinking that miraculously, after four years, he's going to learn how to tie his shoe. Okay? When instead of going two weeks, didn't work, buying loafers, let's move on. Okay? <laughs> but I skipped over two things here, socially important and contextual. And again, independent of what group of individuals you're working with, from neurotypical teens all the way to people on the spectrum, people with intellectual disabilities, these two variables are the most important variables, and they are the most consistently overlooked. Okay? It is this socially important and contextual. In the States, we had this whole thing that Nancy Reagan did called Just Say No, right? There was this whole anti-drug program, Just Say No. So we had Officer Friendly come in and they practiced with kids saying, Just Say No. And so the officer would pretend to hand him a joint and the kid was supposed to go, No, thank you. Okay? Which, if you're going to turn down drugs, you have to be polite. That was sort of the rule. Okay? Did it decrease drug use at all? No. <laughs> no, there's no contextual connection between, you know, being out at a party with your friends and you like that girl over there and she's getting high, so you think, well, maybe if I get high, she's going to like, like, once you take out all those variables, the just say no doesn't count anymore. Okay? And we know, if we're talking about autism, we know kids with autism don't generalize well. It's one of the few consistencies that we really see. Okay? Yet we insist on teaching skills, community-based skills in our classroom, and then wonder why the kid doesn't do it in the community. We get the fake cash register and the fake food and the fake money and the fake this, and then wonder why he fails to do it. Okay? Because it's all context. Socially important. Like I said, I'm tired of meeting people who can do a math worksheet. Okay? I think there should be a law that after the age of 12, we are not allowed to use worksheets, Velcro, or laminate with anybody <laughs> with a disability link. I think it should be like, like one of the few things that the United Nations gets together on and makes a global initiative. <laughs> okay? Because they become sort of the, 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 the holy grail of what we do. I can't go anywhere without... Like, I love it today. Like, if I, I can walk into a house and I know if a kid with autism lives there because there's Velcro on the kitchen cabinets. Because they're going to put, like, little pictures up there, right? Now, I understand if we need that, but, like, we sort of stop them. We don't go beyond it. We don't think what we're doing. And we don't think about why is this an important skill to teach? Okay? We don't think about the critical variables in life. I'll talk a bit about sexuality at the end of this talk. And... There was a poorly done study um, by Ivy in 2007 where she looked at 25 parents of kids with autism. That's why it was poorly done. It was a very small sample. Uh, but what she did is she asked parents to rank order how important these 25 outcome variables were. And the parents put free from abuse and harm at the top of this list. And then she asked the same parents to rank order how probable she thought that outcome would be. And they put free from abuse and harm towards the bottom of the list. 
Okay, the statistics on abuse of people with developmental disabilities in general is appalling, yet we don't do anything to teach kids how to be safe. We don't do anything to teach kids how to report. We don't do anything to teach kids whether or not this is appropriate contact or not appropriate contact. We talk about it, but we rarely address these issues. So when we move forward into adulthood, it really is critically important that we start thinking about this. Again, it's not rocket science. I cook, my wife says that was good, I'd probably cook again. Okay? I drink tequila, but not that anybody here has done this. I drink tequila, I get sick, no more tequila. Okay? Although this also shows you the transient nature of some of our interventions. Because it really is. I drink tequila, I get sick, no more tequila for about six weeks. Okay? I go to work, I don't get paid, I quit. Flying out. It's a, the, the, just, just yesterday, flying out. I realized, and I always assumed, you know like the, the economy plus seats on planes that you have to pay an extra $59 for and you get like five inches extra of leg room? I always assumed that was a positive reinforcement contingency that you bought those seats because you wanted leg room. But I realized that it's really a negative reinforcement because for those seats to be valuable, you have to be exposed to the crappy seats. <laughs> and so it terminates your access to the crappy seats to get the good seats, which really aren't that much better. But only in contrast, do you think, ooh, I got the good seat now. <laughs> okay? This stuff works on all of us. It's not, like I said, it's a universal phenomenon. Couple quick things, and I'm not going to go over all this. Yes, we got over 35 years. Um, you know, we have a lot of empirical validation. Uh, I would point out that I do not know of a field that's more person centered than behavior analysis that to do this right, you know, we often get slammed as we're controlling. We're trying to control behavior. We're trying to, you know, one of the worst things that happened is when we started this behavior modification, you know, that we were modifying behavior and then Clockwork Orange came out and we were doomed. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, if I really, my job is to transition control from external sources to personal sources. I want you to control your life. I'm going to give you the tools to do it. That's, how, that's the goal of my instruction, is to transition whatever control I might have to you. Okay? If you're only able to do something when I'm in your presence, that doesn't matter. Like, I need you to do this across the board and across situations and all this stuff. Interventions based upon applied behavior analysis, recognize the power of positive reinforcement. Duh, right? Duh. Quick show of hands. Some of you have asked you this before. But you know what the answer is. Quick show of hands. Don't think about it. How many people here think you get enough positive reinforcement in your day-to-day -day lives? That we do? That you do. Good. Zero. <laughs> and you're freaking behavior analysts. <laughs> all right? Even Skinner said we're all responsible for our own reinforcement. So that's fascinating that you guys don't think that. Okay? Now, if you're going to a little sometimes I speak too fast for myself. Um, if you're responsible for your own reinforcement, you can get more reinforcement. You can say, what do you think of that project I did? What do you think of that paper? Do you like this tie? What about that meal I cooked? Do you think this, like, you can solicit more reinforcement. A friend of mine, Randy Harwitz, is the best at doing, we'll be out at a conference and we're all at a bar and she feels nobody's paying attention to her and she will say, stop